We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. All right, welcome back, folks. This is going to be a little bit more of a fun kind of cultural conversation type of podcast with a uh, man you may know, Zuby. Uh, Zuby is an independent rapper, author, podcast host, public speaker, creative entrepreneur. Uh, so tens of thousands of albums independently, performs all over the place, does public speaking all over the place, currently in Austin on a nomadic tour, as you say. So Zuby, th- thanks for being on. How's it going, Dan? Happy to be here, man. I mean, it's going well. Um, it's going well. We're in August, like I said, we're in August recess, uh, which has very little recess, <laughs> but uh, when it really comes <laughs> down to it, um, look, you, you're you're an interesting guy. Um, uh, you're involved in a lot of things. I know you came up on my radar like a couple of years ago uh, because you were <laughs> you're just kind of sarcastically beating the women's deadlift um, with a with a 525 pound deadlift. And so my question is that your max? Probably that's probably not your uh, max, is it? No, no, no. My uh, my PB is six oh six. I did okay. that. At All right, that's not that body weight. Body weight at body weight of around one hundred eighty three. I pulled six oh six. So that's okay. Best of all. Nice. What about now? How are, how is your how are you able to maintain deadlift? You know what? I haven't been deadlifting that much over the past couple of years. Um, I had a back injury back in wow about twenty sixteen or so. And ever since then, it's always been a little bit touch and go. So when I start getting back into deadlifts or heavy squats, as I've done a few times, sometimes it just kind of, kind of, kind of gets tweaked. So I, if I do them, I do them relatively light. I stay well below my max. I probably don't even go above about 50% of it because I'm, I don't, I don't compete. I'm not a professional power lifter. So, um, you know, it's good to have my, my PBs there but I'm not really at a stage where it makes sense to be trying to consistently break new personal bests if I'm not actually going to be competing or doing anything with it. Yeah. Um, unless you want to uh, identify as a woman and, and out-compete <laughs> well, them and feel really good about yourself. My, my current record is still standing. If you go on Google and you search UK women's deadlift record, my name still pops up as the first name. So uh, I, I- Wait, really? It does? I don't need to defend- <laughs> It, <laughs> yeah, go on Google. Search a UK women's deadlift record. Wait, but did, did that? I thought Try it was it a out. joke. Did, did that actually get into <laughs> like the into like the UK record books? Well, it wasn't actually done in a sanctioned competition. Okay. So technically, it still, it's not still in the comes up books. on Google. Okay. Yeah, but if you if you Google search it, my my name will still uh, pop up right there. Yeah, this is <laughs> infuriating. Um, <laughs> That's funny. So, I mean, how that, that like I said, that's kind of how I, I came um, to, to get to know you. And I was on your podcast uh, maybe a couple of years ago. It seems like a long, yeah, 20, it was a long time ago. Um, and, you know, what what drew you to, I think, the, the the culture wars, so to speak? You're always involved in the culture wars. You get you've been canceled. Um, you, you actually have a rap song, right, called OK Dude, because you got taken off Twitter deep platform for just saying OK Dude. What, what's yeah, up with I, that? Like, how, how do you, how did you get into all this? You seem like a really nice guy who doesn't like the, <laughs> the, 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 the muck of the culture wars, but you're in it. Yeah. Well, I definitely wouldn't say I've been canceled. I think I'm uncancelable. Um, I have been temporarily suspended from Twitter for a few days back in 2020 after writing the hateful and violent rhetoric of, okay, dude, that was literally the tweet. That was all the tweet said. What was it in um, response to? Okay, so let me tell the full story. So I had a li- I had a tweet that was going viral. I get a lot of viral tweets um, every week, and I had one going viral, which was called something like five tips for single women on how to get a great guy." And um, it was like a very basic list. It was something like uh, grow your hair long, be in shape, be sweet, uh, be nice. It was like, it was like very, very simple and basic. And anyway, it was it was going viral for whatever reason, as these things do on Twitter. And someone wrote something in response and it came from a verified account. Someone said something like, uh, this is terrible advice. And I bet I speak, I bet I sleep with more women than you do. And I literally just responded and said, okay, dude. And that was that a week later, um, I was on a train. I was in the UK at the time I was coming back home from London 
And I got an email from Twitter saying that my account has been locked for violating their content policies. And so I'm, I'm confused. I, I click on the email, I go in and it says your account has been locked for hateful conduct. It says, you know, you may not discriminate, threaten or harass people based on their race, their gender, their nationality, their religion, so on. And so I'm like, I'm, I'm reading through this list. Like I am pretty certain that I have not done this. And then I scrolled further and it had the, it had the offending tweet and it just said, okay, dude. And I was like, wait, what's, what's going on? So I, I, I go on the Twitter app and I, I thought maybe I was, I thought maybe it was some type of phishing scam or something. I was like, this can't be real. And then I go and lo and behold, I can no longer access my, my account. Um, so it was, it was a very weird situation. It had actually ended up becoming a, a funny thing. I made okay, dude, t-shirts and hats. Yeah. And then I made a, a song called okay, dude, which I think is now my most, my most streamed song online, <laughs> made a music video for it. So it actually ended up uh, working out pretty well for my business, but it was just a very strange and bizarre incident that of all the, I think of hundred thousand plus tweets I've put out there now, the one, the one they determined that just was too far was okay dude <laughs> hundred thousand holy crap oh, um, yeah i've been on there for 13 years now oh geez i i basically just got on twitter when i got into politics <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I, I i do it because i have to yeah, um i hear that what wait, wait, wait you you tour the country speaking like what what subjects are you speaking on because you're involved in quite a few things between music mm. the culture wars uh fitness uh so what 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 do you generally what's your topic that you generally talk about yeah, I do a lot, man. I mean, in fact, next week I'm speaking at a social media summit in Atlanta. But just last week, I spoke um, at the Young Americans for Liberty uh, mm -hmm. Revolution 2022 event, which is their national student conference. Yeah. And the week before that, I spoke for YAF, Young America's Foundation National Conservative Student Conference. Um, week before that, I was at Freedom Fest. So uh, it's been different things. The the two speeches I gave recently for YAF and YAL were around a concept I've been thinking about. Um, you hear a lot of people, of course, talking about using the term culture war, a lot of people talking about political polarization. And I was thinking about it and I've kind of coined a new term, which is not, a, not it's not a popular term yet, but I'm coining this term, which I call moral polarization, because I think that seems to be what's going on. And I think it's deeper and a more accurate terminology for use to, to use to describe what seems to be happening in places like the USA and other parts of the Western world, where there seems to be this, uh, you know, people used to have the same facts and agree on objective reality existing and then draw different conclusions from that, have different ideas of how to tackle it, different ideas for policies and so on. So to me, that's kind of what you'd call standard political polarization, right? Some people think the government should be more involved, some people think less and so on, but fundamentally on the morals, you kind of agree on it. And I think there's a rising and disturbing trend of the morals themselves being very much opposed to each other. And I think that's what's causing people to get more divided and more polarized and more heated up because they're kind of viewing the other side as, you know, not just not just wrong, but as as monsters, as, as evil, right? It's all it's yeah. all getting inverted and it seems that the root that people used to have and those shared common values and traits and it's not not traits really more more like more more like moral foundation it mm -hmm. seems like that's becoming more and more polarized so i gave a talk on that topic just sharing and vocalizing some of my thoughts on it and also giving some suggestions on how people can have better conversations with people who may disagree with them or agree with them or some combination of that. Because I think that this increasing moral polarization is actually a, a massive threat to the USA and to a handful of other countries. I don't think it's sustainable for people to be living in these completely opposite realities where people don't even agree on the facts or even agree that facts exist in some case. Well, it's an important topic. Um, mm. I see it a lot. I've become pretty discouraged, frankly, um, just w watching it happen. It, it, it is this, it is this false sense that it's good versus evil. Yeah. And look, are there some really bad people on both sides that you might even consider evil? Mm -hmm. um, sure. But, you know, to, to express and people express it to me all the time. Like, no, it's, it's all of them, Dan, like they, yeah. they, they mm -hmm. really, they want to, 
they want to do the, the they're truly evil they're truly the devil you know owners and then on the left they think the same of yes of conservatives exactly. just heartless terrible people and it's just it's just kind of strange i mean you, you have to live in twitter to to really truly believe that you have to talk to no one mm-hmm. <laughs> you have to talk to none of your neighbors you must never go out to the restaurant or a bar and just mm-hmm. and just interact with with regular people and if there's not enough of that well, well, Dan, it's so interesting you say that because people were artificially prevented from doing that. So oh, yeah. I don't, right? I mean, that's a huge factor of the impact of the lockdowns and stay at home orders across the world that like many other things, I think was not, was not considered, right? I mean, it wasn't considered, look, we are, we are social creatures. I don't know all of the psychological effects on an individual or on a community mm-hmm. of preventing people from seeing each other's faces and smiling at each other and talking, just doing all that normal everyday stuff that keeps us normal and keeps us human. As you alluded to, when you're just there online and you're scrolling and you're scrolling, it's very easy to get caught up in this outrage cycle and you're seeing very extreme opinions and it's, it's very fiery. And, and then, you, you know, you normally you go outside and you, you go, you go to the mall or you go to the park. Oh, cool. People are normal. Like Americans are good. People are normal. People aren't at each other's throats, but for, for months on end, that was all people were getting. So I think stuff was already, it was already fraying prior to that. Mm-hmm. And it then was definitely fraying, I think yeah. That, yeah, I think even, if you, I mean, if you remember back to 2020 with the, the BLM protests, which mm-hmm. turned into the riots and so on, again, not just in the US, all around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of that was just that pent up aggression. By that stage, people had been locked in their houses for three, four months in some cases and hadn't been going outside and being normal. And then there was that spark. And I think that's one reason why it was more chaotic than I think it would have been if that had happened during a normal time. Well, that, that's very true. But I mean, like you said, it's been fraying for a long time. Uh, the, yes. This 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 doctrine of good versus evil has been going on for quite some years now. Um, and it's social media has exacerbated it to an enormous extent. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. And because and, my mm-hmm. thoughts on that are it's exacerbated it because Look, usually you think these things or you maybe you, you get your news from some fringy website that's just looking for clicks and outrage. And so it's, it's always telling you the, the kind of the craziest thing it thinks you want to hear about your own side, about the rhinos or about the left and whatever. But then you had to engage in normal life and go to work and, and you were you were sort of repatriated into society every day mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. there wasn't social media. But that that changed over the last 15 or so years. And so now you can just keep affirming this nonsense and this outrage and keep affirming it and keep finding the people, especially if you want to go down some rabbit holes, you can keep finding mm-hmm. those people online. And I'm not, I'm like struggling to find some, what the, what the overall social good is of, of social media. <laughs> I mean, there's, I'm sure there's a lot, but man, mm. it's, um, people are just so mad and maybe because I'm always in politics. And so I just yes. see it all the time. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's disconcerting. Yeah. I mean, you know, as someone who makes a, a significant chunk of, of my, my living off social media and ha- I have done for, you know, it's been a valuable tool to me as an independent musician and creator for over 15, for 15 years at this point, really. And to me, the way I look at it is like a tool, you know, it, it's really a tool. It's like, it's, it's like a knife, right? You can use a knife to create art. You can use a knife to prepare food for people. You can use a knife to stab yourself, to stab other people and so on. So when I look at all these tools, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, they're, they're all, to me, they're tools. They're tools. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's the same way that people, you know, I look at guns, right? When P, there's a lot of talk right now, you know, guns, 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 gun control, control. I'm like, it's it's a tool. It's a tool. Um, as we all know, a gun doesn't get up and jump out there and attack people on its own. A knife doesn't attack people on its own. It's like, well, what is that tool being used for? And as someone who I believe has used social media to create, a, to help create and spread a lot of good, um, I certainly see the up, the, there's a lot of upside to it. I think the problem is that most people end up being controlled by it rather than controlling it. And there are many things that make that liable to happen. Number one is it's so new. You know, we're not, 15 years is not a long time. As far as humans being human beings go, being connected to hundreds of millions or billions of people in this network, yeah. it's very, very unnatural. Another thing that happens is it, it's dehumanizing. Right. Because people just see people just see this little avatar 
right? In the real world, people see you, you talk to people, you can see each other's facial expressions, you can hear their voice, you can see their, you know, you, there's that natural human empathy. It's, it's actually, unless you're a really nasty person, it's actually quite hard to be really mean to someone face to face because mm -hmm. you can see that you're hurting them and, you know, you, you just empathize. And this just gets this gets disintegrated online, right? You just think you're, you, cause you're just tapping into it on a keyboard or on a thing. You, you're not seeing how the other person is responding. You forget oftentimes you're talking to another human being on the opposite end of it. And all of us can be guilty of this sometimes. So I think that's another, that's a problem. Another thing I noticed, and I think this is a big problem with Twitter, especially is, and not, not a lot of people make this point is that conversations happen backwards on Twitter. Hmm. Conversations happen backwards. And that's a big issue. If you meet someone in the real world, how do you start a conversation? Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. Oh, where are you from? What's your name? You know, oh, cool. Like, what do you, right? You, you find common ground, you build rapport. You don't jump immediately to your hot take on, on a really spicy or controversial topic, whether it's politics <laughs> or it's religion or it's socially, right? You, you, don't, you don't start a conversation yeah. with that normally. And it happens the wrong way around on Twitter. The first thing people see is going to be something that is spicy or controversial, or you're just yeah. out there just kind of shouting into this abyss and other people are then able to reply. But by the time that already happens, and then, you know, people will look in the bio, right? They'll, they'll see your profile photo. They'll see the bio, they'll see the tweet and boom, they've already got an image, a caricature of who you are. This is who you are. This is what they believe. It's not an accurate representation in most cases, but that's what they're now operating off. So they're not talking to Dan. They're not talking to Zuby. They're talking to that X guy, right? They're talking to that, that yeah. person who represents that thing that either they like or they dislike. And it's just very dehumanizing. So I think those are some of the reasons why it can get so hostile and fiery and weird and aggressive on there in a way that it doesn't tend to in real life. What do you what do you think the kind of the the status the current status of social media is um, in in political social media which is what I pay attention to mm. you know it does seem like it's taken a taken a dive you look across all accounts and it seems to me and this is my sense because as a politician I don't just Im imbibe my politics through through social media I I do mm. have to constantly talk to normal people and. It's, it's been obvious to me for a while now that um, a lot of people have given up on social media. They don't want to be on it. And so that, that leaves a very extreme, like dedicated few to continue following, especially political accounts. I, I don't know what the mm -hmm. case is for, for other types of accounts. You, you add to that the change in algorithms where, you know, something like uh, Instagram, which is what I tend to use. Uh, okay. It just, it seems to me to reach, the, I don't know, more regular people. I, I just I, I still haven't met my voters who are on Twitter. I don't know. I don't know if they're really there. Um, and so, you know, you used to put out longer videos that people could digest kind of like they're watching YouTube. It's just it's not the case anymore. They, they, they won't. The, the algorithms don't reward that. Um, and, and maybe people's attention spans don't award that anymore either. But are, are you sensing I guess what I'm getting at is a sense of exhaustion from the public mm -hmm. on politics in general. And is that the sense you're getting? And, you know, and then I want to ask you about you mentioned three different political events, all kind of young people, young conservative sort of events, um, mm -hmm. very different kind of organizations too. And so I, I want to ask you what the state, what you think the state of the conservative movement is. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think, you know, so the truth is social media continues to grow. If you, if you look at the numbers, the it's, it's growing, it's growing. There's, I think there's over 4 billion people online now. And I think the majority of them are now use social media. I mean, Facebook itself has, close to 2 billion monthly users. TikTok and Instagram have more than 1 billion monthly active users. That's a huge chunk of the global population. And uh, people often in the West often forget that there are areas you know, across Africa, um, South America, certain parts of Asia, where just like we've had this wave over the last 15 years, they're about to or in the process of having it. So it's I think it's estimated that in about 10 years, there's going to be over 8 billion people online. Um, so it's it's growing. It's growing. So I know with people, a lot of people I know personally, um, I think are, I think now that we're 15 years into this social media and smartphone combination, people are getting more hip and aware to some of the dangers 
Uh, you've had movies and documentaries, things like The Social Dilemma, which a lot of people watched and were like, wait, hang on, we're being we're being manipulated. The algorithms are doing this and that in a way that people didn't really used to think of it. If I think of my, my own parents who are in their 60s and 70s, I remember sitting them down and actually explaining to them how Facebook makes money, right? Because they didn't get it. And they were like, whoa, like they're taking all of this data and I have all this information. I'm like, yep, same with Google, same with Amazon, same with Instagram. That's how, you know, you are the product. It's free, but you are the product. So again, you have to be very careful with that tool. Um, and you had a second question. It was about the conservative yeah, so, so, to, totally unrelated but okay well well kind of related because i mean the political exhaustion that i sense and i think is is very clearly true mm -hmm. um might be related to just the general tone of politics and you know carry because what, what and maybe I'll, I'll preface the question with this is as you were talking about you know your your speech about this this uh, what'd you call it the um Mor the moral politicization of yeah moral polarization moral polarization I, I can't do it today. You know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I was thinking about that. It does occur to me that there's plenty of uh, conservative events, not necessarily something like YAF. It's a little bit more intellectual, um, you know, in the William F. Buckley tradition. But there's plenty of political events that if you go up there and, and like, I know exactly how to, to deliver this line and it'll get a big cheer. And it'll go something like this. Look, let's be honest, people. The truth of the matter is they're not just wrong. They're absolutely evil. And you know it. Mm -hmm. everybody will check yep. yeah. guaranteed so mm -hmm. that is not healthy um and i don't really care how healthy the left's movement is i just i do i well it, it's unhealthy and it's easy to beat. Mm -hmm. it's easy mm -hmm. as hell to beat i do care how the right um how the health of the right is and um i've been worried about it lately curious what your take is yeah it, it's interesting man and and i get where you come from and I have a take on this, which may surprise some people um, because oftentimes, you know, people want me to very much sort of play or cater to one side, but that's not how I am. I'm, I'm, I'm very pro humanity, right? I mean, I want, I think you want both sides of the political aisle I mean, it's more complicated than two sides, but you want, they, they should both be healthy. Well, true. Right? I, I mean, I agree yeah, with that. I, I, didn't, yeah, I didn't mean to that, suggest otherwise. I just yeah, mean as yeah, far yeah. as like what I can affect and what my concerns yeah, I get. Are. You're absolutely I, I get, right. Yeah, I get. I get that totally. And I think it's um, it should be a, a concern to to everybody. I mean, I, I I'm personally of the opinion that we we need more sane liberals, right? Like, I think I think the oh, yeah. the, the, the because the left side of the political aisle. I mean, if you compare it to Obama 2008, right? Look at the Democratic Party in, in 2008, if we're talking about the USA. But even in the UK, we have a sort of similar thing going on. It was, it was so much more, it was much more moderated. There was more, there was more common ground. It wasn't being run and pushed by people who were openly calling themselves, whether it, it's socialists or people pushing for, we, you know, we want on every issue, you know, the, people used to agree on what men and women are. They weren't pushing the whole trans <laughs> agenda. Now, you know, uh, even on something as, even as something as messy and not nice to talk about as abortion, you know, they went from safe, legal, and rare to anytime, any place, any reason, no limits, completely unrestricted. Like it's, it, it's gone off in this, in this very weird direction. People use the term woke, people use the term cultural Marxism and so on. And then of course you get a reactionary, a reactionary side to that on, mm. on the opposite side of the aisle. And I think that whenever people start to see one another and this, this includes potential ideological opponents or people with different ideas, as you said, when, when people start to see each other as, as evil, Right. Not just I disagree with this person, but I can, you know, that's a decent guy. That's a decent gal. You know, we just have different ideas on these things. That's very different to, okay, those people are just, are just evil and we're the good side. We're the good 50%. They're the bad 50%. Meanwhile, they think we're the good 50%. They're the bad 50%. Because what do you do with an enemy? You, you want to, you want to crush them. You want to extinguish them. You want to, you don't want to coexist with mm -hmm. a true enemy. You don't want to coexist with evil. So, that type of rhetoric, I personally stay, I, I avoid it. I stay away from it's, as you said, it's an easy way to get applause, but I'm like, Hmm, I, I think that's raising the temperature. I'd, I'd like to cool the temperature and yeah. I, I, I try not to, you know, intentionally go out there and just be 
inflammatory or unfair or paint with such a broad brush. Just like I don't like it when people say, oh, like, you know, all conservatives are X or all these people right. are, you know, I, I try not to also do the demonization on the other side and just go all, you know, you can be talking about 100 million people and just say, oh, well, all those people are it's the all, all cops are bad mentality, a cap, right? You know, yeah. all cops are bad. We all, all, all white people are bad. All black people are bad. All whenever you start talking about huge swathes of human beings like that, number one, you're just inaccurate. It's, it's, it's literally incorrect. <laughs> and also it's just not, it, it's not helpful. It, it there's, also not a practic- there's not a practical value to it. If, if your goal is indeed completely winning, right. And yeah. completely beating the other side, if that is indeed mm-hmm. your goal, um, and and you're not actually at war all right as much as you like to pretend to be and it's like yes. everybody like takes their mm-hmm. pictures with their ars on on instagram and thinks they're real cool they don't know how to shoot that thing they don't even know what attack reload is i bet in any case <laughs> they don't they don't know what the hell they're doing um i make fun of them all the time and uh <laughs> not all the time but but you know aside from that War in politics is a war of persuasion. It's a war of ideas. And if you're going to win the war, you do have to win more votes. And so there's a persuasion technique that, that fundamentally has to happen if that's going, mm-hmm. if, if you're going to win. And I, I worry that there's more and more people who have zero interest in, in even acknowledging that fact, they have zero interest in that persuasion war and, mm-hmm. and full interest in the war of attention from their own side. And I see that this is this is what I call the woke right, to be honest, because they share so many values with the woke left, um, victimhood, grievance politics, uh, engaging in very provocative behavior and then feigning disbelief. That someone would actually react to it and then claiming mm-hmm. victimhood as a result. I, I watch this play out over and over again. It drives me crazy. There's that there's a heretic hunting that has been very mm-hmm. prevalent on the left. You know, that's where we get these terms, cancel culture and all this. But to say there's no heretic hunting on the right is crazy too. Cause I mean, we have a word for it. Rhino hunting. Mm-hmm. And we had a crazy ass <laughs> candidate put up, put up a, a video recent of a, an ad recently, Eric Greitens, fellow Navy SEAL. He was on mm-hmm. Navy SEAL for like less than two years, by the way, the SEAL teams do not respect that guy. Let's all be clear about that. Um, but he had this rhino hunting permit ad. And, and again, <laughs> I bet at some of these events gets a huge yeah. cheer, right? Cause nobody, mm-hmm. nobody likes, Nobody gets more excited than conservatives when it comes to hunting fellow conservatives. And I, well, I, I'm, I'm worried about that trend. Yeah, man. Well, I mean, if we're going to expand out beyond the U.S., you have to think, I mean, what, 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 are, what are China thinking? What are Russia thinking? Right? With thinking all it's this very in- easy to divide these people. There yeah, is that all- easy. Exactly. With all that infighting on the political lines, the racial lines, the gender lines, the sexuality lines, anything that you can split people by, the, you know, when I zoom out and I I kind of look at the bigger picture, I do also think this is putting, I love the USA. I'm from the UK, but, you know, I really, really love the country of the USA. It's such a, it's a one of a kind country geographically and, and historically. And it's also with all that dynamic activity and entrepreneurship and diversity and opportunities it's also quite chaotic right it's quite chaotic it's not it's not as settled a country as somewhere like england which has you know this about thousand thousands of years history and it's it's just more it's just more calm and, and chilled right you don't have like such a culture war and all these battles and so on and so i think the usa is in quite a precarious position where it's domestically right i don't think the it it seems like external enemies don't even need to do anything at this point right like they can just sit back and watch and go hey they're just tearing each other apart right like they're not they're not united against us i mean what if i look at china and this is not me picking up the the ccp or anything but i'm like they look united Right. They look, they look united. They're kind of on the same page and they're just trying to grow. They're looking at a hundred years. They're not looking, okay, to 2022 and 2024. They're looking, okay, where do we want to be in the year 2100? Where do we want our country to be? Where do we want the people to be? And so on. Um, And that's a, that's a potential threat on a, on a global scale. I mean, if people want to live under that worldview and have that expanded out, then fair enough. But um, I think for the USA to retain its sort of place on a, on a global level, 
a lot of this stuff needs to be calmed down. You can't be spending five plus years debating what a man and a woman is, or an, you know, like that just looks so goofy to anyone outside of <laughs> to, to anyone outside a handful of countries that you're yeah. people are just tearing themselves apart over over this or over that and. Yeah, that's and more, um, and more and way more importantly than that is something like energy policy, because I mean, like the, the man and woman, stuff, you know, I, I, I always have to like take a step back and be like, am I mm -hmm. exaggerating some of the culture war claims? Because if I go interview a thousand people in my mm -hmm. neighborhood, like nobody really cares about that stuff. That that's the well, that's, they should. The, I'll, I'll, I'll the tell truth. you, they sh uh, the thing is, they should care. They should care because it's being pushed upon the next generation. It's being pushed upon their children. Well, it is. It, and again, depends on the school district you're in, depends on where you're at. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, I guess my point is, is it's, mm. it's, it's, it's doubly bad because it's a thing. It's, I'm not saying it's not a thing. I mean, heck I talk about it, but I, but mm. I do have to like question myself and think, like, is it, is this really as prevalent as sometimes we make it out to be? And are we focusing on it to the detriment of, of fighting about very serious things that will seriously affect our geo strategic uh, position in the world? again, like energy policy or border sovereignty, whatever it is. As, as you were talking about the UK, I don't think I even told the audience if they, if they don't know you, you're from the UK. Yeah. Um, they're like, you kind of have a funny accent, but it's not quite like <laughs> that funny. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, for it, people who don't know, I, I grew up in Saudi Arabia and um, I was actually in an American school from K through five. Okay. So I've, I went, I was in both the, um, my, my dad's a doctor. He's a physician. Yeah. Um, so he worked for a big oil company out over there. So we actually, li I lived in Saudi Arabia for 20 years. And then wow. um, I went to boarding school and university in the UK in my teenage years. So yeah. The university, so any, any, would it, would it be a university that any of us would know? It's like a good one. Oxford. Yeah. Oh yeah. University okay. Of Oxford. Yeah. yeah. Heard of it. Well-educated. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, so I mean, I do find your, that's why one of the reasons I think your opinions are interesting um, cause you do come, it is always interesting when someone comes from the outside and, and can just observe a little bit unemotionally mm -hmm. and, and you think you do a good job of, of keeping emotions out of it. And, um, I, I, do you have any opinions on how, how the Saudi system works or is it just so unique that it's oh, wow. not even worth analyzing in a, <laughs> I, I do. It's, re it's really different. That, that in itself is a, is a, is a long conversation. I mean, it's such a different system culturally traditionally historically religiously politically it's totally different you know saudi arabia is not a democracy it's a it's a monarchy so this whole political system you know there's no left and right in saudi arabia there's no mm -hmm. there's no votes there's no campaigning and congress mm -hmm. and this and that right um so and also you have to consider it's and it's very hard for westerners especially if they haven't spent time in the middle east to get their head around this is that the, the country is, you can't separate the culture and the politics and the ways of doing things down to the laws. You, you can't separate it from the religion, right? It's not like in the UK or in the USA where these things are separated and segregated. All of it is based around Islam and Islamic belief and Islamic law. So if you're looking at why things are certain things are the way that they are that's really what it tends to be rooted in um it, it's a, it's a very interesting place i've often said to people that um i think it's one of the most misunderstood countries in the world because it's a place that if you ask most people's opinion on most countries they don't have that strong opinions right if you ask someone's view on um albania or estonia or chad like people don't generally have an opinion. If you ask someone's opinion on Saudi Arabia, you'll find a lot of people have very strong opinions on it, despite the fact that very few people have actually been there or know very much about it. And oftentimes they complete, conflate a ton of different Middle Eastern countries together and they might believe things that aren't true and so on and so forth. So I've uh, one of the things I get more criticism from than anyone is when people think called, when people think I'm being a Saudi apologist because oftentimes I will uh, portray, you know, as someone who lived there for two decades um, and had a lot of positive experiences there and generally had a great childhood there, I have a certain perspective. It's not that I'm not aware of certain flaws or concerns or actual massive problems in some instances. But I think it's interesting when you talk about any country, you know, if someone says, if you're talking about the USA, if someone even says the USA, are you talking about 
the landmass? Are you talking about the government and the politics? Are you talking about the people themselves? These are all quite different things for every country. Um, I imagine most Americans would not want to be, they, they themselves probably wouldn't want to be judged by the worst things that their government has ever done or been involved in. Um, and I don't think it would be fair to judge the USA based on, you know, the worst things. There's, there's pros and cons. That's the, that, that's the honest, that's the honest situation. So I'm happy to call balls and strikes with different places or, or cultures or systems, things like yeah. that. But we don't like nuance in this new world. Uh, Zuby, we yeah, don't people, like yeah, people don't, people, yeah, I think people, <laughs> and, and well, I think we, people I just want me to say yeah. USA good, USA good, Saudi Arabia bad. But um, it's it's really not that simple. Honestly, I don't even know if people want you to say that anymore. Uh, yeah, that's the scary part. <laughs> like, um, for, you know, for for a long time, I've I've heard the left uh, denigrate America, but I certainly have heard that from the right quite a bit lately. Mm. Um, America, mm. no matter what America does, especially with foreign policy, it's wrong, and everybody's a victim because of us. And I was like, yeah. you know, I heard that a lot from my left wing professors at elite universities over the years, and now I hear it from the right, which scares mm -hmm. the hell out of me. Um, going back to the, the woke kind of culture stuff, I, I did have a question that I that I forgot to ask as you compared the UK and the US. How, how is the 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 woke situation in Europe? Is it as yes. bad as it is here? Is it different? Are we exporting it to them? Are they exporting it to us? Nobody can really figure this out. <laughs> yeah, the USA is exporting it. Sadly, um, Ooh, I, I wish in America. The UK yeah. <laughs> I, I wish that uh, that weren't the case, but it, it really is. It's interesting because a lot of these ideas have their original roots in Europe, right? Uh, aspects right. Well, of the French Revolution world. started all of this. Exactly, right? Uh, you know, the, 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 Frank, the people from the Frankfurt School, Karl, Karl Marx himself and, what, and so on. So those ideas kind of came from Europe, got implanted over the US, but now in their new incarnation, uh, the gender theory, the queer theory, the critical race theory, all of these things the USA is really exporting them to the rest of the Anglosphere. I've noticed that the Anglosphere, the English speaking countries in particular, seem quite vulnerable to a lot of this and some parts of Western Europe, but Europe seems a little more protected from some of these more radical ideas. It seems to be Canada, Australia, New Zealand, USA, UK that are really going for a lot of these ideas and not really thinking about the downstream consequences of them. So yeah, a lot of it is being exported, even in places, even in ways it doesn't make sense. If you want a very, very clear and obvious example, look at uh, look at BLM, the mm -hmm. whole Black Lives Matter right. it doesn't make organizations. Sense. <laughs> it, it, yeah, I mean, it's it's already got its issues in the USA, but it's not even, it doesn't even make sense to try to take that and put it on top of the UK. Like it, it's, like the the British police don't even carry guns, right? The British, <laughs> right? which the, I really the, don't understand. But uh. yeah, but, but like, like there's no, you know, the the black population in the UK is about two percent as opposed to thirteen percent in the USA. There isn't the same history, right? Mm -hmm. Black people in the UK are generally not people who descended from slaves. There was no there was no Jim Crow in the UK. There right. wasn't, you know, like although that whole history that is somewhat, not totally, but somewhat unique to the to the USA, that, that several hundred years of history. The UK has a different history. It played a role in it. Of course, you know, the British were heavily involved in, in, in the slave trade and so on, but it's just not the same. So you can't kind of take those ideas and just whack them on top of a country like the UK. Um, and it makes it makes sense. So when you see people you know, when you see people in the UK, in, in London with, with, you know, signs up saying hands up, don't shoot. You're like, yeah, what do you what, shoot you with? What? Yeah. yeah, yeah, a, yeah, bunch yeah, of, yeah. a bunch of polite, dry jokes. Yeah. yeah. Some good British humor. <laughs> like, what are you... it's a, it, yeah. That's when it, it gets very cringy and you're just like, what are you, what are you guys even talking about? You're just trying to it is weird. It, it, it's it's the grievance thing, right? You know, people wanting yeah. to be people are looking for this crazy sense of mission and purpose. Yes. I mean, it really yes. like desperately so. And you know, oh, uh, did yeah. you did you did you know that you 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 know in 2020, you know they started tearing down statues in the UK as well. Did you know that? Oh, really? Yeah, you know when there was that whole crazy <laughs> it's wave. The thing. Of the, it's the yeah, thing to yeah. do. It it became the thing, and people started tearing down statues in in the UK as well. Um, it was 
it was very bizarre to see. It was very weird to see how the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis led to these riots and protests in across Europe, in, in Australasia, in parts of it. It, it was a very strange phenomenon. Um, and that's certainly something that um, unlikely would have happened pre, pre-internet days. Yeah, I mean, that, that whole subject is, is it's not real, hasn't been front and center for a little while now. And uh, I don't want to bring it front and center. <laughs> I'm thankful for that, but it, it doesn't mean it's gone away. And it's only until the next viral video and, until it is again. Mm. And, you know, there's, there's just a, there's a real desire on the left to, to keep those grievances alive. Um, to keep it on life support and just from a practical standpoint um and again just not not having the grievances i, I suppose it's easy for me to say and say this is the most practical way forward but it, it is the most practical way forward is to mm-hmm. you know again establish a, a liberal sense of equality which we we have done in the united states it's not it's not clear how you would get more equal than we are now without yeah. infringing on the rights of some in order to in order to um, uh, redistribute wealth to others. It's mm-hmm. the only way to do it at this point. Uh, people just don't want to do that, right? It's, it's a completely different philosophy of, of what government is there for and, mm-hmm. and what human relations really are fundamentally. Yeah, two things I often come, come back to on this and wider topics is there are two things that I think are really lacking in the culture and in society right now, particularly in Western countries. And I think that's causing a lot of chaos. And those two things are perspective and gratitude. Mm. I think there's an absence of perspective and there's an absence of gratitude. And I think that's what fosters this resentment, which drives all these, these grievances and all these movements and all these people just getting riled up and angry. I think that people haven't taken the time to step back and say, okay, let's look at the progress made in the last century. Let's go back to 1922 and let's compare 1922 to 2022 in terms of equality and fairness and genuine tolerance and kindness and human decency and life expectancy and medicine. And I mean, if you just look back, 100 years is just is one person's lifetime. And if you look at the progress that's been made, it is phenomenal. It gives you this sense of the sense of gratitude. It's the same when you when you travel. If you travel and you you've been to various parts of the world. And then you go back to a country like, you know, the UK, if you travel around some, you know, developing countries, and then you go back to the USA, or you go to the UK, you can't not feel a sense of, of gratitude and a sense of perspective of, okay, you know, this place is not perfect, but, right. you know, on a historical level, on a global level, we're doing pretty well. And we've made some pretty good and pretty fast progress. And people are always seeking this, this utopia, right? Because it's not perfect. Yeah. Because it's not perfect, they're destroying good, right? They're like, it's very good, but it's not perfect. So, you know, we need to dismantle and tear down and deconstruct and decolonize and, mm-hmm. you know, just bring bring the whole thing down, even though, and I think that's very, I, I think it's juvenile and I think it comes from a lack of perspective and gratitude. I think people are just so used to th- this comfort and so used to things just being how they are that they they genuinely take it for granted. I mean, yeah. there are millions and millions of people, hundreds of maybe billions of people in this world who, if they could snap their fingers and be on U.S. soil, or they could snap their fingers and be in Canada or be in the U.K. or whatever, they would do so, right? I mean, yeah. there's a border crisis for a reason. There's immigration crises for for various reasons, and you know, and and I'm not seeing all these people complaining about America leaving it. I'm not seeing them flooding out. Um, you know, the, people can leave if they want, but it, a lot of people are not doing it. They'd rather just be there and complain and complain and complain, and. I think that's uh, I do think that's a real big driver of a lot of the issues. I think if people could take that step back and just be like, okay, let's take a breather. Let's look at what we've got. Let's look at how we got here. Let's, you know, and, and with the stuff that still needs to be improved or changed. Cool. Like let's do, we, we can tweak. Oh, we need to, we need to tweak this. We need to tweak that. Not just, right. let's just take a hammer to it or take an explosive to it and blow up the entire thing. Cause the chances that, what you're going to get out of that is better. The chances that that'll be superior to what you have at the moment is very low. Very low. I mean, it's, it's a Jacobin thinking it's, it's French revolutionary thinking, right? This idea that you can just start at year zero and through your own deductive reasoning can manage yourself to the best utopia. 
And uh, it's like, you know, your audience, because, you know, when you say perspective and gratitude, I think you're quoting my book uh, <laughs> it's, uh, because it was what I point out is there's the perspective leads to gratitude. Gratitude leads to character development. Character development leads to mental strength. I mean, it's mm -hmm. about mental strength. And so it's it's fundamentally necessary. And it's also necessary for proper governance um, because you're right. The, the, the whole point of having a left and a right and a healthy left and the right is to just really just figure out what the role of government is. Um, and uh, assuming that one of those roles is to maintain a specific set of freedoms, rights, as we might call them, and beyond that, uh, try to improve people's well-being to the greatest extent possible without creating so many second, third order consequences that uh, the, the costs just outweigh the benefits to begin with. And that, that's the eternal, eternal, it'll never end, the yeah. eternal rub between the left and the right. It's the proper debate to be had. Unfortunately, that proper debate has devolved into you know, who has worse people on each side? It's like the Jerry, <laughs> it's, it's the, the politics has become the Jerry Springer show. And that's everybody's mm. fault because I can't get your attention very well if I talk about environmental review process reform, which is like fundamental to your way of life. If you want yeah. good things to happen, I trust me, it is. It's boring. But what you really want to hear from me is something about how, you know, we're going to get copies of Hunter Biden's laptop and we're going to spread it all over. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's like, <laughs> As far as accountability yeah. goes, that you know that is kind of important, but it's but like we we get distracted very easily. It's the Kardashianizing of our politics, and I mm. I, I just I want that to stop. Um, to, uh, that's a great term. That's a that's a great term, and and that's what it is. And and you know what, Dan? I mean, being being reflective on this all, I mean, some of it is a sign. You know, a lot of the the fact that people are even can even afford to have this so called culture war is a sign of prosperity in a, in a weird way. I mean, it shows that you look at the, some of the problems that people are fighting over and you're kind of like, you know, are these, are the, are these the big, are these the biggest problems? I mean, you must have a pretty, you know, you must be pretty far along and pretty comfortable in your society for these to be the issues that people are worrying right. about and thinking about all the time. Cause again, if you go to a developing country, they're not having certain conversations. People are, people are trying to, People are trying to eat. People are trying to feed their families. Yeah. People are trying to, you know, just live, stay alive, survive, beat nature, you know, not get screwed over. And yeah, some of that to, to a small degree, you know, it, it still exists in the West to, to an extent, but I think so much of it is, is just from comfort and human beings get weird when we're comfortable. Um, I think the anxiety builds up in people and that desire to fight and that desire to be part of something, you know, that you, you kind of alluded to it earlier, the desire to go to war without really going mm -hmm. to war, mm -hmm. you know, like human beings have been fighting forever. So I think we, it's, it's innately within us to have that certainly tribalism exists within yeah. us. Um, but also that mentality of, you know, getting ready for war or being prepared for some type of major threat. And we oh, haven't yeah. really had, we haven't really had them. Um, you know, yeah. if, even if you look at the, you know, the, I think people massively overreacted to, uh, you know, the, the whole COVID thing. And I think <laughs> yeah, part of little. it was, <laughs> yeah, but it was, it's the, it's the part of, you know, it was that same, okay, like this is the fight, right? This is it. Like people yeah, got yeah. so, people got so, even now yeah. people don't want to let, so there's people who don't want to let yeah. it go. Right. Cause it, it, go, it gave, gave them that, it gave them that purpose. It was like, and now the mask yes. has become like the uniform. It's like the arm, yes. like in the military, you know, we got our patches and like, mm -hmm. there's, the military is a very healthy place for that kind of behavior. Yeah. And, um, and if you, and if you, but if you're not in it, yeah, there's, there's a sense of loss. We, we really are designed to, to be part of that tribe and sort of to defend our borders and, you know, we'll figure out what it is. Some, it'll be something and there's healthy something. ways to do it and there's pretty unhealthy ways to do it. And, um, yeah. you know, what, what, one thing I've noticed in politics is, I went to a pretty liberal school. Um, we have kind of weirdly similar upbringings. I was born in the UK, ended up in the Middle East. But the difference is, is I was back in Texas. Well, not back in, I don't think I was probably the first time I've been to Texas when I was like three. So, so I don't remember Scotland or Egypt. Um, but, you know, I grew up in, I grew up in Houston. My, my family's American, of course, they're from Houston. It just happened to be living overseas. Same, same thing, oil business. Mm -hmm. And I uh, went to a liberal school. Um, Tough, but I don't remember politics being on everybody's mind all the time. And by the way, that was like at the beginning of the Iraq war, the Afghan war, you know, it, it could have been on everybody's mind all the time, but it, it wasn't necessarily. 
And now what I hear from kids in high school even is that like, I mean, there there's friends groups are based on politics, which is nuts. It's mm-hmm. nuts. And people are so desperate to come to a, a very fast and hard opinion. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you don't know anything. You're, you're God. I mean, it, none of us really know a whole lot. <laughs> and, yeah. and part of seeking new knowledge is the ability to be humble about that fact. And there's a s- serious lack of that <laughs> going on. And mm-hmm. it, it, it's, it's, it's disturbing. I tell kids all the time, just, you know, what's cool saying, you don't know saying you're not yes. sure just yet. And you don't have, you don't have to choose the side. I hope they'll choose my side. Once you do choose a side, <laughs> I mean, if you're smart, you will, but, but you know, it's, it's just like, live your, live your life a little bit, get gain mm-hmm. some experiences and, and some, and some tools to be able to frame information and, and frame your thoughts as information comes to you. Mm-hmm. Do you know, it, it's actually a, a, I think it's quite a deep philosophical thing. I think that um, a lot of it comes down to a con- the concept of identity and I think that we're having a little bit of a, more than a little, I, th- I think we're having quite a big identity crisis in terms of one, pe- people being comfortable and confident in who they are and feeling like they can be a member of a healthy tribe. I, I, th- I think the tribalism is innate within everybody, right? We all have various tribes that we belong to. And that's not something that's necessarily negative or positive. I think it's just a human trait. But I think in the absence of, you know, with a the, the, many things, you know, decline of the nuclear family, decline of religion, decline of certain, um, you know, people used to have these lifetime careers where, okay, cool, like we're a family of blacksmiths or, you know, we're, people used to have more things that I think they could just be kind of firm in their identity on. And in the absence of that, people are searching for it in all sorts of ways. We've already touched on the gender stuff. I think that's a huge reason why all of that is happening. People wanting to identify into something and be part of some group. It happens with politics as well. And people are, you're seeing it, right? People treating politics as a, like, like a religion, right? Treating politics as, as, as a religion and it supersedes your family. It supersedes your relationships. You know, oh, you can't be friends with that person because they vote differently or they have different beliefs. All of this, and I think it's a, I think it's an identity crisis. I also think that people used to be comfortable. You know, I think Americans used to be more comfortable being Americans and saying, yeah, like I'm an American. What's your tribe? I'm an American. Whereas I think now more people are like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat or I'm, I'm this yeah. or I'm part of this group or I'm part of this organization. It's not, I'm not hearing a lot of messaging. Again, this is me coming with the outsider perspective. I'm not hearing a lot of messaging about Americans. I'm hearing a lot of messaging about, you know, white Americans and black Americans and Republicans and Democrats and the LGBTQ community and the the Hispanic community and Latinx and this and that. I'm like, what about Americans? What about just like Americans, right? Like this is, there has to be something that just unites. Yeah, it's been, it's been a while. And I think that, um, if you go back to the, the 90s or the thousands, even that may perhaps even perhaps the early 2010s, I think there was just more of that unity around. OK, cool. People have all sorts of different differences. There's all ways we can disconnect. But, you know, if you go back to, to the 90s or the early 2000s, people people didn't say that the American flag was was a symbol of racism or that it was something to be ashamed of. Now, I'll be honest with you, you probably. When I'm going around the states in different cities, if I see an American flag on a household, I'm like, yeah, probably a Republican. Yeah, I should. That's that shouldn't the, that yeah, shouldn't cross my terrible. mind. Yeah, shouldn't I, that, that, that shouldn't. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't and to be, be clear, that way I think in a in a lot of places it isn't. Um, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think it's that way in Texas necessarily. But sure. you're mostly right. Like <laughs> that's that's kind yeah. of crazy. <laughs> like, and it, it it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be right. A- anyone who's an American should feel may, maybe that's a goal for the USA, right? Maybe the goal should be. Let's create a society. Let's create a political and social climate where everyone in the country feels comfortable and proud to put that, yeah. to wave that flag or to wear, or to wear that flag. Cause I think people used to be, um, and that's even in times when there was more discrimination and more intolerance and, and so on and so forth. And some of those problems were a much bigger deal. I that's still true. think people at that time were still proud to say, Hey, you know, we're, we're American. That's true. And that's, that's the big, when we talk about culture wars, I always say like, look, there's a lot of different culture wars. You know, there's the men and women's like all that. There's now we got these damn drag queen story time things. That's that it's infuriating. (laughs) 
But yes. the fundamental one, and like, don't get distracted. The fundamental one is very simple. It's, it's the question of whether America is a good or bad place. Not even a bad place, good or bad place. It's, it's, it's the question of whether the idea of America, the founding mm-hmm. of America was a good or a bad thing. That's, that's the yes. really fundamental one. And as you chip away at all of these other kind of side stories, again, like the drag queens and the, and the, and the, 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 the male deadlifters just crushing <laughs> dreams. When you, when you really boil it down to it, it's, it's the destruction of norms in, in order to destroy the ultimate norm. And, you know, there's, there's, and, but I do have to say, like, I do think it's a very, very tiny percentage on the left who even think that way. Very, very mm-hmm. tiny. The rest are liberals are easily persuaded because they, because they just, they, you, you tell them things like justice and equality and they're like, I'm with you. Yeah. You're like, hold on. You know, just like, we're for that too, by the way. Just, you know, we just mm-hmm. have a little dip. We have a better way of going about it. Um, I, I, we, I said 30 minutes to you and then we, let me ask, let me ask you like one question, kind of a throwaway fun question. Um, if, if you do want to be a champion deadlifter or let's just say get in shape, what is your advice? Cause you, I mean, you talk about fitness a lot. So what, what's your advice? And you remember a book on, um, mm-hmm. on childhood fitness. I mean, I, it's like, I've done a few podcasts on this and, uh, what's yeah. it called? Yeah, sure. So my children's book is called candy, the candy calamity that's available oh, yeah. at bravebooks.com. Oh, and it's brave my, books. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. and I've got my other book for a grownups called strong advice, Zuby's guide to fitness for everybody. That one's nice. at teamzuby.com. So, yeah, I mean, I've been into fitness, uh, for about 20 years at this point in my mid teens. Yeah. Um, uh, when I went to, so when I was a little kid, I, I was actually an, an overweight kid, but I was, you know, I played various sports. And then when I got into my mid teens, when I was in boarding school in the UK, I started playing rugby. I started playing rugby when I first came to the UK and that's obviously a very physical contact sport. So I started lifting weights because I wanted to get in better shape for that primarily. So that was what started my whole journey into trying to get physically stronger and trying to get fitter and so on. And it's a keystone habit that I've just maintained throughout my adult life. And I actually think it's kind of, it's one of the cornerstones of so many other things that I do, um, amidst all this chaos, it's so good to be building yourself. Right. I think, I think as, as a man, especially you need to have projects. Mm -hmm. I've said many times before that I believe that men are always either building or destroying. And I think that if you are not building creatively your business, your, your family, your community, your own body, then you're most likely going to be involved in either either destroying yourself or destroying other people's projects. So I mean, I I love the gym. I love the fitness for I love fitness for a lot of reasons. There's the obvious aesthetic things and the more surface level things, being in better shape, being stronger, and mm-hmm. so on. But for me, it's quite um I have a, a little bit of a, a philosophical and deeper, deeper take on why I think it's so important for people. I, I genuinely I, I'm saying this hundred percent, honestly, that I think a lot of the problems that were, that we've even been discussing would be resolved if more people lifted weights. (laughs) I like that. Uh, Jackson Steele, you wouldn't be such a jerk. I I think if everyone worked out regularly, then a lot of the temperature would come down. I think that it would humble people. You were talking about people being humble. I think it would, it would humble people. It would make people more mentally healthy. Zero percent, zero percent of the trolls that troll me on Twitter on the left and the right, because there's like Mm -hmm. a healthy mix of both. Zero percent of them, zero percent of them lift weights. And it's, it's obvious because they do have profile pictures. So I know. Mm -hmm. All right. But that wasn't my question. My question was going to (laughs) be, and and, and I would say just to like on a serious note, I mean, you're, 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 it's not just the mental state of people. It's um, the. The, the very physical state of our healthcare system would be, um, you know, we, we complain about our healthcare system is too expensive. It's this and that, that expense almost exclusively comes. If you're looking at like the lowest hanging fruit, it's obesity because obesity lives to heart disease, number one killer, mm-hmm. all of these other problems that are, uh, make our healthcare I, so vastly. I just read expensive. today. It's, it's over 150 billion a year. I think it's between 150, 170 and $180 billion per year. It's estimated that obesity costs the U S healthcare system. Easily, easily. I mean, you want your insurance to go down, boom, there it is. Uh, but no, but my question was like a, a simple um, word of advice to people. Like, so sure. I want you to imagine someone who is one of my trolls on Twitter 
and <laughs> they, they're, they're like 25, but they've got a huge gut. And, okay. you know, they, they, they're just, they're always in their, their mom's basement. They're, this is what they're doing, but you know what? They're going to change their life. And they're mm-hmm. they want it tomorrow. They want to hit the gym and they want to kind of develop a plan one week at a time. I mean, what, how do you even start somebody off from, from ground zero or maybe mm. they were in shape like a few years ago, but they don't really work out anymore. What, what's your what's your favorite set of exercises and type of exercising? Is it like the metabolic conditioning? Is it straight up weightlifting? Mm-hmm. Is it go jog five miles? What, what's your advice? Yeah, man, my this is going to sound might sound like a little bit of a cliche, but what you can the thing that you're going to be consistent with, right? Because mm, whether it's yeah. a diet or an exercise program, if if you hate it right? If you hate it long-term or you don't enjoy and you don't want to do it and you can't be consistent with it, you're, you're going to fall off. So it has to be sustainable. So I don't do something like CrossFit myself, right? Everyone knows that bodybuilders and powerlifters like to make fun of CrossFit, but I'm like, you know what, Mm -hmm. if CrossFit is the thing that gets you in the gym four times, four or five times a week and keeps you in shape, God bless CrossFit, right? If it's powerlifting, great. If you like jogging, so on. I do think everyone should do strength training because cardio training cannot replace all of the benefits that weight training has, especially as you get older. But in terms of what I'd recommend specifically, I'm big on compound lifts. I'm a big fan of squats, deadlifts, bench presses, incline presses, overhead presses, um, pull-ups, rows. When I say compound exercises, for those listening, those are uh, exercises which use multiple muscle groups and multiple mm-hmm. joints. So not just like a simple barbell curl, but a pull-up, you know, you're using your, your back, you're using your trapezius, your shoulders, you're using your biceps and so on. That is really what I recommend. I, I'm also a big fan of keeping it relatively simple. You don't need to do 10, 20 different exercises for each body part, right? Yeah. The basics work fine. You could do just 10, you could do five to 10 different exercises And those are the only ones that you do. And you can build a phenomenal physique off of just a handful of exercises. It's not the case that you have to hit everything from different angles and you need to, you know, do so many things for each body part. So I would recommend keeping it simple, basing it around that. And then similar when it comes to nutrition, because nutrition is arguably even, even more important, depending on how you look at it. I also recommend keeping it relatively simple. I I go with an 80, 20 rule and recommending at least eight, making sure 80% of the calories that you're getting in are coming from good whole and nutritious foods. Um, if you're very, if you're very out of shape, then you might want to, you know, go, go (laughs) 90 to hundred percent. But I find for most people, assuming you're not a competitive athlete or you're not someone getting ready for a bodybuilding show or something like that, if 80% of what you're eating is good, wholesome, nutritious foods, and you're getting your calories from that, if the other 20% is, you know, not, not as, not as perfect, um, you'll, you'll be fine, but any change is good. You don't need to go from zero to a hundred, right? If you're totally, if you're totally out of shape, if you're totally mm-hmm. out of shape and you're starting from zero, then doing 20 minutes, you know, working out for 20 minutes a day is a start, you know, going for a walk for half an hour is a strong start. Yeah. Something is much better than nothing. And then once you're going and your body is moving, then, and also you can, you can take on more because as you get fitter, you can take on more training right. um, and you'll avoid injuring yourself. You'll avoid making yourself, you know, feel terrible or get so sore that you never want to work out again. So those are, um, those are a couple of my, of my basic principles. I would of course recommend my book, Strong Advice, if you want to uh, go into it in more depth, it's helped a lot of people out all over the world but those would definitely be some of my tips. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would add is the consistency. It's easier to keep yes. up than catch up. It's a, it's a mantra we hear in the SEAL teams because mm. the instru- you know, we go on runs and the instructor just kind of runs off and the instructor's like, you know, he, he's not going through buds. So he's yeah. not that, uh, he's not that tired, right? He's not getting his ass kicked every day and he's not wearing a shirt. He's in shorts, maybe, maybe even to me, he's probably wearing boots just like the rest of us, but we're all wet. And so mm. keeping up with this guy, even if he's not that fast, is pretty <laughs> tough. And yeah. if you don't keep up at a certain point and they, 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 they cut the line there and the people who didn't keep up, get the crap beaten mm. out of them. Not, not quite literally. I mean, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like a series of horrible exercises. And the other thing yeah. I would say is, um, and, and you can do that. I mean, two or three times a week, people are like, oh, I haven't worked out in six days. So like, what's another six days. And it's like, well, it's mm. a lot actually. And you can get a lot done in like five minutes. Um, yep. you know, you only have five minutes. 
you're right. You don't have time to go to the gym, but you do have time for five minutes straight burpees. Mm -hmm. And that'll, that'll, that'll get your, your metabolism going for the rest of the day in a very, very serious way. Um, the the other thing I would, Uh, oh yeah, sorry, sorry to cut in. Um, another thing I'd say with both training and diet is don't have this on and off mentality, right? If you miss, you know, you, you miss one good meal, you miss a workout. Don't, don't let one missed workout turn into a week of missed workouts. Don't let one yeah. bad meal string from your diet turn into just, you know, pigging out for the rest of the month or so on like cor- you, you course correct quickly. So, right. you know, don't, don't beat yourself up for missing a workout, but don't also use it as an excuse to just keep on missing them. The, the other thing is the, um, the strength training, you know, I'm not even sh- I think, uh, that that's newer even to, to the military as well. I mean, by newer, I mean, mid 2000s, <laughs> you know, when I, when I was sort of starting out, but you look at older seals and I think your, your typical super in shape seal was like a triathlete, mm-hmm. um, you know, just re- real good at running long distances. And that's just not your, your typical seal. Now your typical seal now can still do those things. Maybe not quite as well as a triathlete, but can also knock out a CrossFit workout pretty, mm-hmm. pretty well, you know, well above average. Um, and also just gonna you know, just do some typical weight training and they tend to be more well-rounded as a result. Um, there's yeah. a lot of good science behind that too. Yeah. It's important for people to realize that st- strength training is also important and you can't just replace it with cardio because it has additional benefits that are often underrated or that people are not even aware of or don't think about, right? It increases your bone density. So mm-hmm. if you're an aging man or especially a woman who is more prone to getting something like um, osteoporosis, right? Lifting weights increases your muscle density. It, it makes you more, um, it reduces the risk of diabetes. It reduces the risk of certain types of cancers. It makes you more insulin sensitive. So you're less likely to b- become diabetic or pre-diabetic. It has a lot of benefits that are beyond just, you know, being jacked or having muscles, um, that's the way people typically look at it, but there are very specific benefits you get from strength training that, um, you, you don't get from just going for a run or going for a swim and so on. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Look, what, is, what is, what does it really do for you? It makes you stronger and you should want to get stronger. And I yes. think that's the conclusion that we're looking for. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Zuby, thanks for, thanks for being on, man. That was a lot of fun. It's good. Thanks good so much, Dan. Appreciate you. it. Likewise. Thank you.